Well, hello everyone. Welcome to another live stream for History by, uh, for History by Podcast. Today I'm joined by Matt Dillahanty. And for those that are unfamiliar with Matt, I imagine probably a lot of you watching this are familiar with him. Um, he used to work a uh, pretty atheist experience. And I, when I was uh, much younger, I used to watch the atheist experience and I very much enjoyed watching Matt, especially communicating with the people that would call in. I, wa- I enjoyed watching him debate um, other Christians for many years. So I'm really happy to have you here, Matt. Um, I'm Thanks. glad that you uh, uh, were able to join me today. And today we're talking about Matt's journey out of Christianity. So anyway, Matt, uh, once again, thank you for joining me today. Sure. Thanks so much for having me. Of course. Um, so yeah, take us right into it. What What would you say is the first inclination that you had that caused you to doubt your faith in Christianity that starts your journey? Well, I, I set out um, after I lost my job um, from Dell Computer, and I thought that God was punishing me for not having become a preacher, which is uh, something that I was convinced I and others were convinced that you know God had wanted me to do, and I kind of ran from it. I spent time in the military, and then I worked on my own career. And when the career fell apart, I was like, well, God's punishing me, so I, I surrender. I'll, I'll do whatever it is that you want. So I spent... Um, it was about a year and a half of pretty serious prayer and study. And at the time my roommate was an atheist and I didn't want to get to have heaven and have God say, you know, Hey, I appreciate the fact that, you know, you finally did what I asked you to do, but why is your roommate who you love like a brother? Why is he burning in hell when you could have, um, you know, talked to him about what you're supposed to talk to him about. So I set out trying to figure out uh, the best way to potentially convince uh, an atheist. And and I had loads of misunderstandings about who atheists were, what atheism was, and uh, whether or not I'd ever really talked to one or witnessed to one before or any of that. Um, and it was before he and I ever had a conversation about it, it was this process of finding the best way to convince an atheist uh, of the gospel was what what backfired spectacularly. And I found myself no longer uh, convinced at all. And how did it backfire? What did you find in the Bible that bothered you a lot when you were trying to utilize it in, in the manner of trying to convince an atheist of the Bible? Well, I didn't, it's not that I found it. I found anything in the Bible. I'd already read the Bible two or three times. There wasn't anything particularly okay. uh, new discovered. What I found was I didn't have good reasons for my beliefs. And when I went and kind of expanded this study to talking about or to looking at you know all right if if i'm going to be if i'm going to believe this i need good reason does anybody have good reason and i started going through kind of standard apologetics and finding logical fallacies and assertions that couldn't be backed up and and all sorts of claims and eventually get to the point where you know it's not like i was an atheist but i definitely couldn't i you know identify as a bible believing christian anymore and so um I went from there to looking at what kind of God might exist or could exist. I love the fact that in chat already, someone saying, as I suspected, Matt was never a Christian. He was merely an evangelical, which is itself a cult. Well, cool story. When you and the rest of the Christians figure out what a true Christian is, come and tell me. Yeah, I I remember that. Um, There's there's some videos of you, I think, uh, that I saw a while ago or some kind of interaction where you you interacted with some Christians claiming that you were never a true Christian. And I've seen this uh, uh, attack sort of uh, upon other people as well. There's there's nothing I can say about it. I actually put up a video. I I put up a video of was I a true Christian? And it's the answer is, um, if you mean, was I actually uh, in a relationship with the risen Christ? No. And I don't think anybody else is or has been ever either. There isn't evidence for it. It's the, this, what is a true Christian thing gets tossed around all the time. What I can say is that I sincerely believed that I was a true Christian, as did not just my family, but the people in my church who later came to debates that I did to ask me what happened. Um, so it, it becomes, and you know, not to pick on the, the one person who, who chimed in, but it's a common thing. Uh, the fact of the matter is, I, there, I have not been convinced that any such God exists, and I, I, I've been doing this for a long time at just about the highest level I can imagine, engaging with 
apologists and people trying to present arguments and evidence. And it's uh, terribly uh, depressing to think, I used to accept all of this stuff. And now that I've found that there are bad reasons, I want somebody to give good reasons and they don't. What they sometimes do is just come in and be like, oh, well, you aren't a true Christian. Well, cool story. Come with some evidence. I remember uh, watching a debate um, that you participated in. It was many years ago. I don't remember the name of the opponent, but the, your opponent was arguing that all atheists secretly know God exists. And I was just laughing. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. It says all atheists secretly know God exists and they're suppressing God because they hate him. There's, I remember, there's a lot to do. Yeah. I remember there was an atheist asking him a question like, okay, well, could that same ridiculous reasoning be used for you? It's like, you secretly know God doesn't exist. And he said, if any said that was absurd. And and it could be under under his model of what he's saying. I mean, I'm try, I try my best to make sure, and there's no telling which opponent um, that was because there's a number of different debate opponents who've who've done something similar um, by saying, "Oh well, you, you know, yeah, you know," and it's because they're committed Bible believing Christians, and when they read a verse that says, "You know, um, God has written His moral code on on your heart," you. you uh, the uh, the evidence for God is is apparent to all, and you know God's given you over to reprobate mind. There's a way to construct all of that to where which the only reasonable conclusion that one can achieve is that everybody knows that God's God exists, but some people are suppressing it, or God has given them over to reprobate mind, or they have some sin in their life that's preventing them, or there's something dishonest about the person that doesn't let them acknowledge, and that's a really neat kind of security blanket for people who may have in fact been having their own doubts and there's no way i mean there's no way to demonstrate any of this i can't prove to you what's going on in my head um but what i can do is if in fact there is a god that god absolutely if if he's the type of god that we generally talk about within christianity and and outside that god absolutely knows what's in my mind and knows how sincere i am and I know what's in my mind, and I know how sincere I am. So when, when believers start to say, well, you secretly know in your heart that you know this, or you weren't a Christian, or whatever the line of thing is where they pretend to, to know what's in my mind better than I do, while all simultaneously, at least for, for Christians, holding up their view of a book where you know nobody knows except for God, um, it, it's laughable because it's an obvious defense mechanism. It's not an argument. It's not evidence. It's nothing substantive at all. It is just a, I think you're a liar. And okay, if all you're going to do is attack my character, I, I, I'm fine. I, I will wait for your God to judge my character because I know that I've investigated this honestly and I know I've identified, you know, the fallacies and, and a failure to, uh, for the many of these things to, to make their case, I suppose. It was as you said earlier about, um, they're making these kinds of arguments because uh, one of the reasons being that they, they believe that God has written uh, his moral code in our hearts. And I'm remembering that there's another, there's another verse in the Bible that states that um, if you walk out from me, you were never of me. And they'll utilize that yeah. verse too to say, Oh, you see, because if you stop believing in Jesus, you were never a Christian. Yeah. And I don't get to decide. Um, I don't get to decide what a true Christian is, and, and it would be a mistake. I can talk about kind of normative Christianity. I can talk about um, Orthodox Christianity. I can point to the fact that there's, you know, over a thousand different denominations that agree or disagree on every single point of doctrine you can get to. Um, and I don't know how any of those get resolved. But what I can do is look at it and say, whichever group is the one true christian group i don't see how any of us could possibly identify that i don't see any criteria that we could use to judge that oh by your fruits you'll know them um the, the the thing is is that even by your fruits tends to work only for a short period of time like you watch a televangelist who you who you my, like my mom had some televangelists that she thought were just absolutely wonderful and they're definitely preaching god's word and um it's clear that you could tell them by their fruits and then they turn out to be you know lying degenerate uh frauds and 
they're not everybody's like that. I know plenty of sincere believers um, who are going to preach till the day they die, and I would be shocked to discover that they were actually frauds. I wouldn't be shocked to discover that they had some, you know, hidden sin or problem or whatever else. But it's since there's no way for anybody to tell who is or isn't a Christian other than your say so, and there's no way for anybody to tell who is or isn't a true Christian, it seems that the responsibility for the clarity on this subject rests with a God who doesn't seem to be doing anything to clarify it. And that's not our problem. And I remember when you used to work for the Atheist Experience, you received, you would answer a bunch of call-ins and you have people, like you were just pointing out that it, 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 it becomes really difficult to argue for the Christian God. And so you have these people calling in, making a bunch of um, really ridiculous arguments I remember there was one guy, I don't know if you were there for this one. It's been a while since I've seen any of these episodes, but somebody called in making some kind of arguments that you don't know by my light bulb was broken or something. And he thought that was proof of God. I don't remember what video that was, but I, I was, I don't know why he was associating light bulbs in his house with God. And I was just, I just couldn't stop laughing. Yeah, I, I don't recall that one. Um, you know, I volunteered with the Atheist Community of Austin and and hosted the Atheist Experience for almost 19 years, uh, or it would have been 19 years next March. Uh, I left there a year ago, or not a year ago. I left there in October, so it'll be a year this October that I've been away. And I'm still doing, I'm, do, I'm actually doing more shows. I'm, I'm on a new network, uh, The Line. I do the Sunday show. Uh, I do a Wednesday show. But yeah, it's funny because... I, I do I do love getting the chance to talk to people who've been watching the show for many years and, and people will have, oh, I remember this call or I have this call that was a favorite. Um, and they will bring up stuff that I don't remember. Maybe, maybe it happened when I was on the episode. Maybe it didn't. My memory after 19 years of doing this, I couldn't possibly remember. There's maybe a handful of calls that I have any strong memory of at all. And the rest of it is just let me get on to the next one because if your goal, as mine is, is to do what you can to find the truth, to encourage people to present their best case for something, and to expose what's wrong with it for the benefit of others, then once you've finished a call, or once I've finished a call, I'm just ready to get on to the next call. I would do, I do a call-in show every day if I, if I, you know, had time for it and if there was enough interest for it. It's one of the reasons why, I mean, you and I have had never met prior to this. I think there was some discussion about possibly trying to set up a debate. And then you were like, Hey, would you come on and, and tell your story? And I'm like, sure. Saturday, mid afternoon, I got, you know, I've got plenty of things that I could be doing, but I'm generally interested in, you know, like if somebody has good reason for something I'd like to know. And if I can use the conversations that I've had where there weren't good reasons presented uh, to help somebody else out, then that's what I want to do. I'm not even sure if it's even what I want to do. It's almost like I have to do this. I don't want. I don't really like putting it in those terms because it it gives people kind of a wrong impression. But I don't know how to not engage on these subjects. I don't know how people can be disinterested in what has to be for the for the from the believer perspective the single most important issue that could possibly exist. Now I can understand why non-believers might be bored with the conversation. You know, they've decided, Hey, uh, I don't have any good reason to believe that. So why would I spend time? I've got a limb. I've got one life that I know I'm going to get every second. I spend arguing with somebody who's religious is a second I've wasted where I could have been, you know, uh, learning something, studying nature, studying physics, um, watching a movie. I liked engaging with family members and, I, I can understand why non-believers wouldn't want to engage. I have a hard time understanding how believers don't, don't love these subjects as much as I do. And it's, you know, I have friends. I was raised primarily Southern Baptist, but I was also went to Pentecostal churches on occasion. I had a friend who was a youth minister. I thought I was going to be a minister. And then he became a Catholic. And it was really strange to me to, to watch someone go from being a Southern Baptist to being a Catholic. And he and I had a conversation about it. Uh, he's one of my best friends growing up. I, I still love him dearly, even though we don't get to hang out anymore. Um, when I asked him why, how he could do that, he's like, 
he, he was asking me how, you know, you and I grew up the same. How could you be an atheist now? And I was like, yeah, you and I grew up the same. How could you be a Catholic? I could understand no longer believing. But what was it that convinced you that Catholicism was correct when you and I were, were raised primarily, you know, evangelical, fundamentalist, Southern Baptist? And it turns out uh, he married a Catholic and he liked to drink and the Catholic Church was okay with it. And I'm like, if that's the depth of thought that you know, how seriously you take this, then I'm an atheist because I'm the only one of us that took it seriously. And I, rem I remember that you would make uh, you've made several videos and you, and you and you and you have often made the point that the God of the Bible, as described in the Bible, is it appears to be an evil, genocidal, immoral character. And you you would often um, make these arguments to try to show Christians that okay, they keep praising their God with the highest esteem. But he's very he's very immoral in a lot of ways. I, the way I look at it, sometimes I think that sometimes when they, they they accuse Satan of being immoral when their own God in their same book was doing what they're thinking Satan was doing, because Satan did what he killed like ten people, and this is in the book of Job, pretty much, while God killed millions, hundreds of millions, maybe billions in the flood, the mythical flood that never happened. So that they keep thinking it's oh Satan's a bad guy he's doing everything bad but like their, their own God is doing this. So when you were deconverting deconverting from Christianity, were you also um, in your own way um, confronted by this when you were going when you're revisiting the Bible all over again and you, and you become reminded of God having committed these mass atrocities? Did that also play a role in your deconversion? It it did a little bit. So there are loads of problems like that um and when when i was a believer it was very easy to ignore and dismiss them god is morality essentially god's character not necessarily divine command but just from his character issues forth the structure of morality if god does something it must necessarily be moral even if we don't know or understand how that's that's the foundation that you kind of accept and begin with. Um, and that alleviates a lot of the concerns. When when the, the book talks about, you know, Elisha cursing a bunch of uh, a gang of youths and they get ripped up by she bears or when God decides to flood the world and slaughter everybody, God must have a good reason. He knows and understands all this better than we do. And when you're a believer and you accept that, then it just becomes kind of, obvious that that's the case it's when you try to push back and say well hang on uh, and one of my favorite questions that i that i asked fairly early on and i've, I've mentioned in the shows several times is uh, i used to believe in god and i used to believe in satan and so the question then becomes for those people who believe in god and they believe in satan how did you determine that satan was the bad one and god was the good one what criteria can you use to show that even if you believe they exist, God is the good one and Satan is the evil one. There is no criteria that you can use to demonstrate that because if God wrote his moral code on his heart, then God will always be judged good by that moral code. But so would Hitler. If Hitler wrote his moral code on your heart, then Hitler would be judged good. When the, when the criteria matches a particular character and you just define that as good, then there's no way to demonstrate that God's the good one and Satan's the evil one. What's really bizarre is that Satan, the devil, all of these various names that get attributed may not have all referred to the same entity or agent or angel or fallen angel um, at different times. And so you have points where, like in Job, where Satan, the accuser, is essentially God's little handyman. He's going to go down and find out what's going on. He's going to report back to God. He's the one that's going to, you know, enact some punishment. Um. When you look at, um, for example, I just I did a video on um, Judas's death. And in two of the Gospels, I think it's two of the Gospels, maybe it's one of the Gospels in it. No, it's two of the Gospels. I think it's John and, ooh, I'm going to mess it up, but it's in the video. Um, the Bible talks about Judas becoming possessed or the Satan, Satan or the devil enters Judas and that's how he betrays. But if you look at the whole story, Judas's betrayal was essential. There is no 
crucifixion, resurrection, none of that happens without the betrayal. As a matter of fact, Jesus flat out acknowledges, I picked all 12 of you and one of you is a devil. So Jesus is, is acknowledging in the story that he knows that he's going to be betrayed by one of them, which he must have picked intentionally for this betrayal to occur because the betrayal is critical to the crucifixion and, and, and resurrection. If that's the case, then not only was Judas doing exactly what God's plan required him to do, which brings into question what free will was there, what betrayal was there. But if in fact, Juden was, as the gospel suggests, uh, possessed by Satan, then Satan was also following God's plan and doing. So all these people, Satan, Judas, whatever, they get, they get characterized as the evil ones who are taking these actions. When they took actions that were required and dictated by God, just as when Pharaoh was, you know, when, when Moses was there, let my people go. And Pharaoh uh, gets hit by plagues and starts to say, you know what? Okay, you can have them. But it, the Bible specifically says God hardened Pharaoh's heart, which means he over overturned Pharaoh's free will to whatever extent he would or wouldn't have had any in the story in order to keep showing off. No, 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 no. I'm not done with you yet. I know you're ready to let my people go, but I'm going to keep doing plagues and then we'll do this again. And I'm going to keep doing plagues and we'll do this again. Uh, it, it is the notion that God overrides, you know, well, free will is a separate discussion that probably won't even go into today at all. But the, the notion that God overrides people's free will is not even controversial. When God talks about giving them over to reprobate minds, when it talks about hardening Pharaoh's heart, when it, it's uh, using the devil and Judas in order to further his plans. If God has a plan and everything must necessarily go to God's plan, then none of you have free will. None of us have free will. Um, and everyone who's ever done anything good or bad is actually doing exactly what God dictated. Because if God created the universe, knowing everything that would happen, and if God could have created a different universe, if all three of those things are true, he created it, he knew what would happen, he could have created it differently, then God specifically created this universe knowing everything that would happen, which means you never had a choice. We've got a super chat question from Mahariya. Thank you for your super chat. Shukran, Jacob. Matt, if there was a historical Jesus, do you think more likely a devout Jew killed by Rome, more in line with James, brother of Jesus, a devout Jew instead of the Pauline myth making? Um, if there was a historical Jesus, I I don't know how much we can actually say about him. I Probably an itinerant rabbi. Um, there were a lot of people in that time frame that were similar to that. Um, I, I, I couldn't really say because to me, there's virtually nothing about Jesus' life that I can guarantee. I would or, uh, uh, reasonably believe. I would certainly think that a more mundane explanation rather than the supernatural one uh, would, would definitely be more plausible. I mean, there's a reason we call we identify things as miraculous or not because the mundane is not miraculous. So I can't really say for sure, but yeah, that might be closer. And after um, he left Christianity and he started having these uh, debates um, a bit later um, with other Christians, um, some of which we touched on earlier, what do you what do you think is probably, if you could think of one, is the what do you think is the most absurd argument for Christianity that you've ever heard? Well, it, it's hard to say which one's most absurd because there's the versions. There's a lot of classical arguments for the existence of God that basically fit into different categories. There's ontological arguments about essentially the nature of God, and teleological arguments and um, uh, moral arguments and all these. It's not so much that even a particular category is more absurd than another, because what we're really doing is saying, hey, we need an explanation for why things are the way they are. And there are people who believe that it's because of a God. And so let's start there and see what we can put together to show um, is real. I, I think I used to laugh a lot when people would say, look at the trees. Um, but I, I laugh. Well, I don't, I don't really laugh. That's not fair. Um, I find it more absurd, not so much when someone presents a bad argument, but by, and, and not even that they are convinced by a bad argument, but 
that they think other people should be convinced by a bad argument. So like frequently when I ask, I mean, it's already happened here today in chat. I will ask someone if they have evidence or good reason to support their belief. And I virtually never get anything that counts as evidence towards the belief. Um, sometimes I'll get something that I can't verify, but what people rely on quite frequently is I just know, I know that I know that I know that I know that Jesus Christ, you, you would believe it if you saw the things that happened in my life. Somebody in chat said, the holy miracles within my life is proof that God does not want me dead. I am protected by God. If you ever meet me, you will feel the tangible, palpable, holy spiritual presence of God in me. I genuinely am, am willing to accept that that individual believes that, um, that they are probably doing their best to present the reason why they believe and yet somehow they don't understand that not only is that not evidence, it's not an argument, it is not, um, it's not close to good evidence or argument for anybody else, and it's not even a reason that they should believe. And so rather than just saying that's the most absurd argument I've ever heard, all I can end up saying is you're just asserting that that you believe. You're not even really saying why you believe. You're not, you're, you're not saying I'm convinced because, even, the, even if you say I'm convinced because, whatever follows that needs to be something that would justify being convinced. And if what comes after that, as was the case here, sorry to pick on somebody in chat, but as was the case here just in the last few minutes, is just a stronger assertion that it is true, then you haven't presented an argument. And you might as well just be saying, I believe because I really believe. And there's, that's fine in the sense that there's nothing I can say. I, I can't prove you wrong, um, but that's true for every unfalsifiable claim and every claim that isn't backed by evidence. And so basically, a lot of the Christians that are defending Christianity and even uh, uh, apologists, they're not really using... Would, would it be fair to say from, uh, from what... From what you from your experience with with uh, with ha with these arguments that they're using inconsistent methodology, circular methodology, and it kind of reminds me of a, a statement by um, Neil deGrasse Tyson. I think he was. Uh, I think I think Neil was talking about the flat earthers. He was making his arguments like that people need to be taught how not what to think, but how to think. Yeah, basically how to think properly. Yeah, I mean, that's probably one of the biggest things that I've harped on over the past 20 years of doing this is that it's more important to learn how to think than what to think. And what religions tend to do is one way or another indoctrinate people into beliefs um, and don't teach them critical thinking and skepticism of how to evaluate a claim. If somebody says, hey, this is true, how can I tell? I did a debate just a week or so ago um, with Cliff Connectly. I posted the debate review of it just the other day, and I'm not picking on these individuals. It's just that by way of example, these are things that happen most frequently. And so they're readily on my mind. And when I ask someone, what methodology are you going to use to show how your belief is true and a competing belief that you don't accept is false? In this case, he has some specific notions about Christianity um, and, and their doctrines that, you know, are biblical. And so if you want to say, hey, the reason I believe them is because they're in the Bible. Cool. Why do you believe the Bible? We can we can go down that path. Um, but he wanted to point out that there were beliefs that someone else was professing that are not biblical, and he rejects them. And I'm like, great. What's the methodology by which you include one and exclude the other? Because if your methodology cannot differentiate between two competing claims, two mutually exclusive claims, then you have no methodology. And if you you know, you, you mentioned kind of circular reasoning. If you begin with, I believe, let me go out and find an argument that justifies it. You've already failed because now you're going to be trying to lead the evidence towards your conclusion rather than following the evidence where it goes. And it reminds me of the uh, flat earthers who um, understood the math behind a globe and understood that there's uh, 15 degrees per minute of rotation on that. And so you should get 15 degrees of drift with a really good um, gyroscope. And so they spent $20,000 on a gyroscope and they hooked it up and they measured 15 degrees of drift. And then they said, well, we can't accept that. 
So they started trying to pack the gyroscope into, you know, various enclosures to try and cut the magical, you know, whatever that was causing it to get this reading rather than just following the evidence where the evidence goes. It is, it is similar to what happens, not in every religion, not in all of I'm not, I'm not just, I don't, I don't just here or anywhere to just, you know, poop all over other people's religions. It's not identical, but the only reason it's not identical is because religions like Christianity are ultimately untestable. They're not falsifiable. There's no way for us to actually get to the truth of it. And so what you have are a whole bunch of people who are incredibly strongly convinced and dedicating their life to it. And yet they can't demonstrate it to anybody. We have another super chat question from uh, Ramon Haria again. Thank you for your super chat. Do you think uh, the rise of Christian nationalism is a reaction to their uh, loosening grip on American society? I noticed more deconstruction happening in the United States. Well, yeah, I've said before that what we're seeing is sort of the death throes, the last g gasp of, of, a, of a dragon, a kind of a dragon of uh, religi religiosity, um, because they started to lose the privileged position and lose the power, lose? They started to lose the privileged position and power that they wielded and things tend to there's it's not like a a steady decline there's going to be spikes and there's going to be regress but while we know that the the nuns the n-o-n-e nuns um are the most rapidly growing religious demographic in the united states and in the west we also know that christianity is on the rise elsewhere in I, I, in one or two countries, I think I, it's been a while since I looked and the numbers are increasing, but they're not necessarily increasing as a percentage of population. And if your, your religious position has had a lot of power for many years and it starts to lose that power, it's not surprising that there's going to be some retaliation. There's going to be a, you know, the desperately grasping and flailing around. So I think that may be part of it, but I'm not really sure. And it could be that despite the progress that we've made towards a more progressive, more liberal world in recent years, we've lost a lot of that progress just in the last six or seven years. Um, and, you know, it's, it's wild to me to wake up in a world that is where there are more flat earthers, where there are less rights, where there are more attacks on the LGBTQ community, where the notion of an atheist being in public office is becoming increasingly less likely uh, in, in many cases, so. And we have another super chat from Carolina Reaper128. Thank you for your super chat. Is Christianity opposed to social progress? You can't really answer this, but I'll, I'll do what I can. And that is, first of all, I don't get to tell you what Christianity is. You'd have to talk to Christians. And the nice thing is, is that you're going to get a lot of different answers from a lot of different Christians, because there's just about as many types of Christianity as there are believers. If you want to know what's wrong with the first Baptist church, you can ask the second Baptist church. And if you want to know what's wrong with the second Baptist church, you can ask the Catholic church. And if you want to know what's wrong with that Catholic church, you can ask the person in the second pew and the person in the first pew and get different answers. That's just the way it goes. Um, part of me wants to say that yes, Christianity is opposed to social progress. Uh, and I would say that yes, by any useful definition, Christianity is absolutely opposed to social progress, but that's separate from whether or not Christians are. There's a Baptist church down here in Austin that I walked in uh, for a, a separate event. I, just, I was there for an event unrelated to church or religion at all. And they had a huge banner of, you know, about equality and Black Lives Matters and, you know, uh, trans rights are women's are, are, are human rights and uh, love is love and all these things in a Baptist church. And as somebody who grew up Southern Baptist, I can look at them and say, whatever it is you're putting up on that, on that wall, while I now appreciate it as a fairly, uh, I mean, pretty extremely left-leaning individual, I can appreciate the fact that you're, you're looking for progress and that you people are wonderful, but nothing on that page is consistent with the, the Bible. Now, maybe it's consistent with, um portions of a bible it might be consistent with like if you said is judaism opposed to social progress i'd have to say no 
because I think that um, the the Talmud being a, a a a movement where you begin with the Torah and you work progressively towards um, you know more modern notions. I think the Talmud moves people that way. The the Bible, the the sixty six books of you know the the standard Protestant Bible that hasn't changed, and neither has what the Catholics added to it. And so I can't. I'd have to say Christianity is opposed to progress, even when Christians are. You know, they often try to scare people with, uh, and we've all heard heard of this one, one way or the other. Oh, you're going to go to hell, and you're going to regret it. And when you die, you're going to you you're going to feel the flames engulfing you. I'm like, well, and there's a hell in other religions too, and Hinduism too. So, which hell are you going? Yeah, and it's for for something like Pascal's wager or whatever. A lot of it has to do with, okay, which hell are you trying to avoid, and which heaven are you trying to attain. And should you be working to attain a particular heaven or working to avoid a particular hell? Should I should I seek out the best heaven or should I just avoid the worst hell? What if there were a variety of hells? What if I pick the wrong one? Um, rather than, than playing a game like that, wouldn't it be better to be intellectually honest and decent and um, to go down that route and say, you know what? Uh, I don't know yet what the truth is, but I'm willing to learn. And as soon as somebody presents me with sufficient evidence of a truth, that's what I'll accept. And if there's a God that wants to punish me in, in a lake of fire for honestly engaging the brain that he gave me and evaluating the evidence that was available, well, then that God's a moral monster that I wouldn't really care to have anything to do with anyway. I, I kind of want to go back to what you were mentioning uh, um, just a moment ago about there being multiple different denominations of Christianity. Okay, what does this church over here believe about this church over here? And, and it becomes a, a a much more hairy and complicated issue because like, okay, so you have tons of denominations of Christianity. And like, I think not only do Christians have different interpretations of the Bible, which is supposedly the perfect word of God. Okay, why, why do so many people have different interpretations of the Bible? But you have people telling each other, well, you're going to go to hell if you have the wrong denomination of Christianity anyway. So which fa which of the many thousands of denominations of Christianity is correct? It's like a needle of a needle of a needle of a haystack. Yeah, it's it's frustrating. I remember one of the debates I did. I, I was standing there, and I've come out many times to point out the Bible's position on slavery is very very clear. And anybody who says, "Oh, the Bible's not condoning or supporting slavery," is just, I mean, like stupidly wrong. It's it's there and it's obvious and undeniable. And yet people want to debate it. And so there were four different apologists standing kind of in a semicircle around me. And all of them wanted their shot to explain to me uh, why the Bible's take on slavery isn't really a problem. Um, the thing is, all four of them had a different line of argument. Uh, and the, it, was, it was nice for me because I was like, okay, you four sort it out. And when you find out what the one true Christian answer is for or Judeo-Christian, even though that's not really a thing, but because the passages about slavery are predominantly uh, in the Torah. Uh, when, you, when you guys figure out what the right answer is, come back and tell me, and I'll do that, because I don't want to have to argue with all four of you. Finish knocking down your terrible argument, then your terrible argument, then your terrible argument, and then if you say, well, those three are wrong, here's the real answer, and then when I knock yours down, what do I got to do with deal with then? If you have no way of showing which of the denominations is correct, then nobody should have any confidence that any of them are correct. And it's not only that, but it's like at this point, like there's so many different translations uh, of the new Testament. And like, you have the, you have the scholarly ones, like the revised standard version, new revised standard updated uh, version that um, scholars uh, prefer uh, to look at. But then you have a bunch of different ones, like the Jehovah witness, uh, Bible, which uh, is a New World translation, and you have other translations that support different or lean towards uh, supporting different denominations of Christianity or different denominations selected certain translations that they prefer. And then they'll make another ar argument from that sometimes, kind of similar to the one I brought up a moment ago about, okay, well, if you don't pick the right denomination, you're going to go to hell anyway, just no matter if you believe in Jesus and God. And they'll say, well, if you don't have the right Bible, same thing. 
that place like okay now it's just gotten way more absurd more absurd than it already was at this point i think so one of the things is i'm i, I love studying philosophy stuff i love studying bible stuff as a matter of fact uh for years now i've been telling people about uh, this utility that i've been using which i think is absolutely uh the best easiest to use easiest to get started with tool for studying the bible um that i've ever found and that's e-sword.net and from there and I've, I've got it installed here um i can pull up i think i don't I, i'm not even going to count but it looks like looks like 50 or so different bible translations um and many of them are cross-reference with bible dictionaries so that for example in Zechariah 11 1 I can see because I have it open now I always have I'm, I'm doing so much with this all the time but um so the first word in Zechariah 11 1 is open and that's the Hebrew word um which is Hebrew 6605 which is pothok um and it tells you it tells you that you know it's cross references against the dictionary and then there's a number of different commentaries and so if somebody's written a commentary like if you want to see John Gill's commentary on Zechariah 11 1 uh, you can do that if you want to see the Kyle and Delich uh, commentary on it. Getting back to the, the question at hand of what if you have the wrong Bible? One of the issues is that th there's enough. It's not like First Baptist Church has its own Bible and the Second Baptist Church has its own Bible. Um, there are different translations and some prefer like the 1611 only authorized version is what right. they say. Um, but there's nobody who can say this is the right version and mostly differences in versions rarely have um disagreements or strong disagreements about things that are critical to salvation there might be different wording that would change excuse me someone's understanding of a certain subject but generally speaking you know it's you get into some debates about, you know, is it salvation by grace through faith or by faith through grace? Uh, is it, you know, salvation without works is nothing. So is works relevant or by their fruit shall know them. And I, one of my favorite debates of all time um, was between two Christians. I've talked about it before. They were absolutely arguing um, about, things that were doctrinally significant to salvation and one of them would show up and point to let's just say 10 because i'm not i'm gonna round it to whatever one of them would would rattle off 10 verses that supported their position and the other one would rattle off 10 verses that supported their position and at no point did either of them say ah you're you've got a bad ver bible version or that version is is incorrect and the verse is supposed to say this or your interpretation of that verse is necessarily wrong and here's why instead it was i'm going to point to the ones that seem to support my position you're going to point to the ones that seem to support your position and it was like it was like a a demonstration of how we ended up with different denominations in the first place and why um you know which bible version you pick up is already going to be problematic at best because they're translated from a few different sources and there are different well we have no originals for anything we have no autograph for anything and so what we have are copies of copies of translations of copies of oral traditions that were passed down and so is it does it really matter if in the uh king james version uh, Zechariah 1 says, o open thy doors, O Lebanon, that the fire may devour thy cedars. And that the English Revised Version says, Lebanon, open your gates so that the fire will come and burn your cedar trees. Um, that's not probably a big deal to anybody. And the only thing that matters is what concept is being conveyed there? And do we have an accurate representation of the concept? And in many cases, we almost certainly do. And in other cases, I hope we don't, because if we have an accurate representation of the concept that says that slaves are your property, that you can beat as long as they don't die within a couple of days, and you they are your money that you can pass on to your children as inheritance, um, that's a very callous and, and morally bankrupt view of owning people as property that I genuinely hope was a mistake. but 
what we know from how they lived, it's, it's probably not a mistake. It's probably slavery was um, common and, and they had a way to justify it. And the Bible has been used to justify it for ages. Yeah, they often try to say that biblical slavery was like um, indentured, indentured uh, servitude. Which oh, it's just servitude. It's not. It's not. It's not as bad as it looks. They'll still say, "Am I?" No, I think it's as bad as it as it sounds. And I remember having. Um, I had Dr. Joshua Bowen on. We were talking about uh, biblical slavery in, in the Old Testament. And we touched a little bit on the New Testament, and he made a point, and I think it's a very powerful point that I think that believers need to uh, research because I think once they realize it, say, like, okay, no, this is not going to work because Joshua Bowen uh, shows that the the slavery in the Confederate States of America, for example, looks just like the slavery in the Bible. And that's what biblical slavery looks like when it's enforced. So yes, it is exactly the slavery that it sounds like in the Bible. It's not, it's not servitude. It's, yeah, it's, yeah. well, my big thing is that I don't care if it was describing indentured servitude because indentured servitude is also immoral and it's not like people had True. Uh, yeah. good, uh, good options for uh, legal uh, securities or anything else. And so like in Leviticus 25, um, I think uh, verse 44, let me check. Yes. Uh, 2544, it's about, well, let me get back to my King James so that somebody can't suggest I've done this wrong. But uh, 2544, it's both thy bondsmen and thy bondsmage, which thou shalt have of the, he shall be of the heathen that are around you. Of them ye shall buy bondmen and bond servants. So this is specifically about how you can purchase your slaves from the heathen around you. And the reason that's there is because Exodus 21 gives the rules uh, for slavery, but there's two sets of rules. There's one specific rule for Hebrew slaves. Um, they only serve you for six years. And then in the seventh year, they go out free. Um, uh, with You can just the seventh year, they get to leave unless you give them a wife and kids and they say, hey, I don't want to leave my wife and kids, in which case they become your slave forever because you don't have to give up the wife and kids. So the Bible not only tells you how to treat Hebrew slaves differently, but then tells you how to trick them into becoming your slaves forever by giving them a family. Uh, and then it goes on to give the, the, the rules for non-Hebrew slaves. And yes, there was, I when I bring this up, it's embarrassing to watch Christians kind of twist themselves and Jews in some cases, twist themselves into knots trying to defend this. Because they'll say, oh, yes, yes, but everybody went free in the year of Jubilee. Yes, every 50 years, supposedly, we would free everyone. So let's say it's the year before the year of Jubilee. How many slaves am I going to buy that year? I think I'm probably just going to wait a year so that everybody I buy will be my slave for 50 years. And by the way, What's the average lifespan here? Not the 969 years that the Bible wants to pretend was real when it wasn't. Um, but 50 years is pretty much an entire life. If you start with a, a teenager, let's just say 15, and that's when you put them to work. Maybe, maybe you could get them earlier. But now all of a sudden, 50 years, they're 65 if you got them right after the year of Jubilee. I bet the slave sales right after the year of Jubilee were... Uh, extraordinarily more impressive than the ones the year before. Right. And yeah, and, and yeah, I just want to uh, clarify, of course, uh, uh, indentured, indentured servitude is uh, horrible, but the, but the point that I was trying to say is that I think I, I think this, I think I did convey this properly that they try to say that as if it were softening it when it yeah. doesn't really soften what the Bible says. Yep. Um, just to be clear. Um, and then kind of going back to uh, God's uh, other aspects of the God characters and morality, when he sends uh, Jewish armies to wipe out, uh, he sends Israel Israelite armies to wipe out the Canaanites, the Amalekites, and all, all these other groups of people that are totally cleansed. Oh, that's okay. So that genocide is okay. And then it says, Oh, God's not genocidal because it, in the end, everything's Satan's fault because 
Satan caused man um, uh, to sin. But you make a good point earlier when you say that, um, well, all of this is part of God's plan anyway, as the Bible lays out. Like, God planned for people to sin. The, ser the snake, where did the snake come from? God created everything. He created the snake that lied to Adam and Eve, right? And so they were tricked, in a sense, by God, because God created the snake, the serpent, uh, the nakash, that tricked them into falling. That's which God created anyway. And the Bible also says, I think this is in Isaiah, that God created both good and evil. So what do you do with that? <laughs> yeah, it's... I, I don't, I'm no good anymore at, um, because I'm not a Christian. I'm telling you what the Christian take is on something or what my take as a Christian is. Uh, a lot's happened from the time that I was there. And when I look at these things, I can put on my hat a little bit and say, here's what I used to believe. And so what I used to believe wasn't that Satan or the devil or whatever name you want to put on him, he was not responsible for the introduction to sin there. And Satan was used as God's accuser um, and God's right-hand man and, and all this stuff, depending on where you're reading it. So in the, in the Genesis book, the snake didn't lie either. It, it told the truth. So whether you look right, at it, was it, God, it, was, it was God that lied. I had it flip. Yeah. It, whether you, you look at the snake being a snake or a serpent, or a Satan, uh, all it did was tell the truth, which is, you know, hey, God told you you're going to die on the day you eat this, but yeah, what's really is God knows you're going to be like gods. You're going to have this understanding. And it was man who brought sin and death in the world. Man's rebellion, man's rejection, man's disobedience is what brought sin and death in the world. That was my take uh, as a, you know, a Christian. And so, the devil could be there to tempt you, but he could be doing that on God's behalf as he did, you know, when he basically persecuted Job on a bet. Uh, th the notion that it's the devil's fault is just never resonated with me when I was a believer because it was human beings is who sinned and, and brought sin and death into the world. That was my take on it. Whether or not that's a common Christian take, I don't know. At the end of the day, I'm still stuck with this. No matter how problematic the book is, no matter how many things that I can point to in the book that uh, I find repugnant, that doesn't matter because it might still be true. So all I care about is whether or not it's true. And I've not only seen no good reason to think that it is true, I've seen really good reason to think that it can't be true. And if there's a God out there, not only is this God playing the world's greatest game of hide and go seek, but he's also doing absolutely nothing to solve anybody's confusion or clear any of this up for anybody or to demonstrate how or why what he said was good or, or not. And it, it's just the world we live in. Compare this world with two versions of the world, one where there's a God, a biblical God that exists and is real and the Bible's true and accurate, and one where that God doesn't exist. How do you tell the difference between those two worlds? If I can't point to anything and say, ah, here's how we know that we live in the world where God is real and this story that people believe is true, instead of God isn't real and the story that people believe isn't true. There's no testable way, there's no mechanism, there's no falsifiability. Um, I don't get to just begin by assuming that God exists and running with that. And where's God in this? And this is why the argument from divine hiddenness is, in my view, probably the strongest uh, argument against the existence of a God and completely unnecessary because you don't need to argue against something that hasn't bothered to demonstrate any reason to think it exists in the first place. And before we close, what advice would you have the people that are struggling, that like, they're doubting their Christian faith, just as you did, and they're leaning towards becoming atheists or agnostic? What would you, um, what would your advice be to those people that are 
struggling and are, and are on the on that crossroad right now. Sure. I think probably the number one suggestion I make is for people to call recoveringfromreligion.org or visit the recoveringfromreligion.org website. There are counselors there. They are not there to turn you into atheists or agnostics. They are there specifically to deal with people who are struggling um, with their belief and or who have found their way out and are looking for help uh, as well. Um, it, it is a good resource, a great resource, to talk to people who've been in a similar situation to what someone struggling with their faith would be in. But the other one is don't, don't beat yourself up. And if you do change your mind, don't immediately go, oh my gosh, now after all these years, I have to rah, 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 I'm an atheist. Um, you want good reasons to believe anything. And also you want good reasons for holding your new views. And you need to be careful not to overstate. I don't run around saying God isn't real generally. I will say something like that on occasion to make a point, but to adopt a burden of proof that I can't meet would be silly. I can't prove to anybody that God doesn't exist. And I don't have to, just like I don't have to prove the Loch Ness Monster doesn't exist. I don't have to prove fairies aren't real. Until somebody demonstrates that there's really good reason to believe in fairies, the default is that they don't exist until there's reason to suspect that they do. And when you list the reasons that people suspect they do, what you often get are not only fallacious lines of reasoning, appeals to popularity, um, appeals to moral foundation, uh, appeals to it just feels right or it has the ring of truth. What you don't get is here is a validly structured syllogism where the premises are supported by empirical evidence. Instead, you get countless ways of avoiding that. Well, you know, God's just... God sees more than we do and knows more than we do. So God's got his reasons for not giving us explanations. Now that doesn't fly. If you're finding your way out or if you're concerned and you have doubts about religion, do not set an end goal. Don't set an end goal of I'm going to be a better Christian or I'm going to be an atheist because you will lead yourself to that goal. Instead, keep asking questions, keep looking for evidence and Follow the evidence where it goes instead of leading the evidence where you'd like it to go or where you're afraid it's going to go. And realize you are not alone. Find an organization people hang out with so that you're not just completely surrounded by people reinforcing your ideas, which is the biggest reason I recommend recovering from religion.org. Well, thank you for joining me today, Matt. My pleasure. Hello viewers, thanks for watching this video from the History Valley YouTube channel. Please don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell. And if any of you wish to further support this channel, please consider checking out this channel's Patreon page and becoming a patron. And or donate through PayPal or through Super Chat during a live stream. Thank you.